first down, they hand off to Marlon Mack. Huge hole, 50-yard line. He's at the 40, still going near sideline. He's at the 10, he's at the 5, and he will score. Touchdown, Marlon Mack. Touchdown, I-N-D-Y. And again, it's picked off. It's Darius Leonard. Leonard with a second INT, and he's streaking down the near sideline. He's at the 40, he's at the 30, he's at the 20. He's going to go. A pick six for the Maniac. Horseshoe is back, baby. The horseshoe is back. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bring the Juice podcast. If you guys haven't checked out our most recent video about the offense positions, we had a question for each one. Today, we're going to be talking about the defense and the group questions for this one. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. We're going to come into this defensive line who has been dominant this year in pretty much every facet so far. So the one question we had with the defensive line was after Justin Houston is gone, who ends up taking his spot after his tenure is done? Do you resign him or do you test your luck with trying to find somebody else, whether they be on this roster or you potentially get a guy in free agency like you did with a DeForest Buckner or do you draft someone? Because obviously we know that Kamoko Ture is going to be coming back here soon and we anticipate that he's going to be the one defensive end that we are pretty positive is going to remain on the roster, but you still have that one other spot on the edge and you don't know who's going to take it. But Cody, who's going to be the other guy? Does Justin come back or is somebody else going to fill that role? Yeah. I mean, I almost think it makes sense similar to what they did last year. Uh, I guess this last off season when they decided, ah, we're going to let Jabal Sheard walk. Um, I think maybe that's the option, the route they go a little bit. Um, I could definitely see it going both ways, though. I could see them re-signing for a one-year deal or something along those lines. Because he's been he's been a pretty good player. He hasn't been, like, the player he was last year. But I feel like Houston's still been a solid defender at uh, getting after the quarterback, putting some pressure on, uh, stopping the run, all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that is a big question mark. You know, you've invested a couple second-round picks into some pass rushers. You mentioned Kamoko Ture. Tyquan Lewis, who had been starting at the other defensive end position, and then Ben Banigou, who the last couple of weeks has been a healthy scratch. So, you know, you saw that last year a lot of times with Tyquan Lewis. And I think the big difference for me, Derek, with Banigou, between Banigou and Tyquan Lewis is your three technique was giving you absolutely nothing last year. And Lewis was still inactive. That tells you anything about um, how he was, you know, viewed last year. So the defensive end position is still looking pretty good. Also, Akadim Muhammad is another name potentially. Um, he's still a young player. The Colts climbed off a waiver a couple of years ago. He's he's always been a solid player. So, you know, I think the Colts would be wise if they decided to not re-sign Justin Houston. Let's say in this situation they didn't. I think it would make sense for the Colts to potentially uh, go out and try to find another guy um, just to add to that defensive end position, whether that is in free agency, whether you make a trade for somebody or you draft a guy. Um, I think, you know, maybe you do that. You just don't know what you have, I guess, with Ben Banigou at this point. And, uh, you know, maybe if Kamoko Ture comes back um, this next week against the Packers and he just is the player he was before the injury, maybe you don't worry about it because then you got him and you got Lewis on the edges. You got Banigou to kind of help. You got Muhammad. You feel pretty good about that defensive end position. So uh, I think it really depends on how Ture plays and then the progression of Banigou this offseason is going to be the big question mark for me. Um, and if you do elect to resign Justin Houston and then if you don't, how you address it or if you address it at all. All right, I want to ask you about this guy in particular because, you know, a lot of people are throwing his name off to the side saying, you know, he's going to be 30 years old and we don't want him. We, it's like stuff like that. But I'm looking at the numbers this year. This guy is leading our team in sacks, but he yet is not getting recognition very well, and that's Danico Autry. Yes. Danico Autry being moved to the edge has six sacks on the year projected to get 10 sacks this year, which if he does, that would be his first season with double digit sacks of his career. I mean, is it, is it really that, is it really that hard for Colts fans to admit that it might be a smart idea to potentially keep Autry on the roster? Cause I've seen a lot of people just say, nah, he needs to go like, yeah. I mean, why? I know he's 30, and I know it's probably not going to last forever, but he looks like when he when he was moved to the edge this year, it, it looks like he's finally found himself 
being a little bit more reliable and gaining a lot more pressures. Yeah, and I mean, so far, two out of the last three seasons he's been on the Colts, at least up to this point, he's led the team in sacks. Like, you look back in 2018, I believe he was almost two double-digit sacks. He was around nine sacks yep. in that year, and he didn't even play all 16 games. He was a force. And then you move him more outside, and, you know, he's just been consistent, even if he hasn't been starting. Now, I haven't really looked at uh, who's been starting. I don't really think that matters because the snap counts are all that matters. So, uh, but yeah, the Nico Autry has just, you know, continued to put great pressure on the quarterback, continue to make plays. Um, and I, I would definitely re-sign him. Maybe that's the, the route they go. I completely somehow, like a lot of Colts fans for some reason, forgot about Danico Autry. And I think maybe he's worth re-signing and letting Justin Houston walk because your defensive end position is loaded right now. Yeah. So I, I definitely think that potentially could be an option um, that yeah. you could do moving forward is, is do that, is uh, re-sign Danico Autry to maybe a one or two year deal let Justin Houston walk, let some of your young guys continue to get reps and yeah. just go from there. I mean, honestly, I don't think that's a bad route. And that just is speaks volumes to the, the depth that Chris Ballard has added to this unit. I mean, it did a lot in the offseason to add to the defensive interior. Well, the defensive end position is just chock full of talent, chock full of guys that um, can get to the quarterback and stop the run. So uh, I feel pretty good about this defensive end position, but yeah. Um, I think the biggest question mark is, you know, do you re-sign Justin Houston? What is the future at defensive end? Now, I do want to ask you one more question about Danico Autry because this one just kind of came up in my head just now. Um, I do want to hear – I think I know the answer, but I just kind of want to hear your perspective. Is there any possible way the Colts can trade Danico Autry? Because mm. obviously, like you said – Two of the last three years in Indianapolis, you know, he had nine sacks in 2018, obviously had a really bad season in 2019, but then again, so did the rest of the defensive line that year besides Justin Houston. And then finally moves to the defensive end this year. Again, you know, putting on some decent sack numbers, getting some good pressures. Looks like, you know, he's going to have another solid year. I know he's pushing on to that 30. So like, is there any possible scenario or do you think that that's not even really worthy an option? I, I, I wouldn't. I mean, you have to resign him after this year. The, the trade deadline's already passed. So you can't trade him at this point. Um, yeah. I mean, I think you know, the move right now is just to resign him, have him be a rotational piece at defensive end and just move forward like that. And I don't think teams really would give you a ton for him, quite honestly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Pass rusher, pass 30. He's had some decent moments. But, yeah, I just think for the value you're going to get from other teams, I would just resign him at this point and move forward with him as a depth piece. But, uh, yeah, that is a good question. But, yeah, I just think that's my opinion. But, obviously, and obviously people can disagree. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I would even – I don't even think I would really want to because, like you said, like, I don't know many teams that are – that eager to want to, you know, try and snag a 30 year old defensive lineman that very rarely hits double digits and sacks. So, you know, it's kind of a, yeah, it's a double whammy there when you're trying to look at how much they would get, but you know, it's funny. I look at these questions now and I'm thinking there's a lot of resign questions in here. <laughs> That's pretty much it for this defense right now. Like who do you resign? Who do you keep? And here's another one, and this is the linebacker position. I mean, obviously, there's not a lot of questions about Darius Leonard and Bobby Okariki. They've pretty much cemented themselves as, you know, the two favorite linebackers in this uh, organization. But the big question of, do you resign Anthony Walker, the middle linebacker? And if so, how much do you resign him for, or how much do you think you can get him for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the big question. I've seen I've seen Colts fans go both ways. Some are like, you absolutely need to re-sign him. Some people are saying, no, you don't, because you can, you know, you can let him walk, get a compensatory pick for him potentially, um, and you know, draft his replacement in the mid rounds, and and maybe EJ Speed maybe gets more of an extended role in this defense, uh, because you know, in reality, that that position that he plays normally, uh, you know, if Okariki is your Mike linebacker, that stand position doesn't play a ton in this defense, um, so. I mean, that's a great question, and I think that's just a question we're going to have to have continuing on. Um, I think he's at somewhere maybe around $7 million was uh, for, like, top 10 linebackers. I don't know if I'd say he's there for me, but, you know, he's certainly a solid linebacker in his own right, really good run defender. Um, so I think if the price is right, I would. But, you know, if he's demanding a ton of money, 
I'm letting him walk. You got your two starting linebackers there. Um, as much as I like Walker and as much as Leonard wants Walker to stay, if he's out there demanding a ton of money, I mean, I think it's worth just maybe drafting a replacement and maybe letting some of your younger guys just have, you know, step into that role potentially. So that's kind of where I'm at with Walker. I know you're a big guy, a big fan of Anthony Walker. So I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I am definitely one of the advocates for wanting to keep Anthony Walker on this roster almost at all costs. Like you said, if he's if he's asking for top ten uh middle linebacker money, I'm not I'm not ready to go there. I'm not ready to do that. But if he is wanting to come on a team friendly deal, you know, like say, you know, six six and a half million then I'd be more than happy to say, yeah, let's give you a long-term extension. Because like you said, Anthony Walker's not going to get the majority of the snaps in this defense. He's not. Just because the way the Colts play defense, especially now, now that they got the defensive line the way they want it now, it allows for them to play more two linebacker sets. So it allows for them to play more that way. But again, Anthony Walker is such a good player in the middle of the field when it comes to the ru- to the rushing attack. And not to mention, he's just a leader. He's just a guy that is great by example. Like you said, he's a great he's a great teammate. Obviously, friends with Darius Leonard. They're they're like brothers at this point. You know, you obviously want to try to keep the defense intact because then that helps build chemistry and things of that nature. But yeah, and I don't really see Anthony Walker trying to be, you know, all about the money. That just doesn't sound like Anthony Walker to me. Now I'm sure the first time he walks into Chris Ballard's office and they're talking contracts, probably will hit him with a high ball. You know, it's probably because that's what you want to do, right? You want to hit the GM with the high ball, see how he reacts. And then if he says, well, hell no, then, you know, you can start working on negotiations. But, you know, I mean, I, I think, Anthony Walker deserves a spot on this team because of his leadership, the way he's able to play against the run. And like you said, he's not going to get, he's not going to be on the field over 50% of the time. He's just not. So, you know, if you're going to bring a guy in that gets limited snaps as is because of the defense, why not get a guy that can, that can stuff the run at any given point. So, I mean, you're not going to get a whole lot of other great options better than Anthony Walker even if you drafted one, I don't, I don't know many that would come out and be as good as Anthony Walker right off the bat. But like you did say, if Anthony Walker decides to test himself somewhere else and get the bigger money, you know, EJ speed in the middle does sound very, very intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. And just getting him more of an extended role. I mean, he showed his athleticism after blocking that punt on Thursday night. So I'm, I would be interested in seeing what he has. We already kind of know. And I think the biggest question mark for me is how much are you willing to pay for a linebacker that you said it, not going to play probably 50% of the snap most games. Um, and how much are you going to pay for limited snaps, but good leadership? Like how much, and that's a, a question that Chris Ballard is going to have to have. Yeah. Probably a conversation we're going to have multiple times this off season, mm-hmm. you know, is the production and the leadership worth the kind of money that Anthony Walker is going to be demanding, whether that be, reasonable or not reasonable it'll be interesting to see what happens there but uh but yeah that, that's kind of our take uh that's the biggest question mark definitely for the linebacking group is anthony walker do you resign him do you not um and you know we'll have this conversation throughout the offseason but it's something to start thinking about absolutely all right cornerbacks needless to say this group has definitely uh exceeded expectations beyond belief this year xavier rhodes looking like the literally looking like the all pro that he once was back in 2017. Uh, Certainly looking like that right now. Um, Hopefully he can continue to stay that way. He looks like he's about ready to earn himself another contract, even at the age of 30. If he continues to play the way that he is right now, no doubt that the Colts will probably resign him. And, you know, we rock sin has been a, a above average corner this year. He's certainly improved Certainly still some more things to work on, but has looked better this year than he did last year by far. And the depth pieces have been really good. You know, TJ Carey, you know, has been phenomenal when he's played. Kenny Moore, he's exactly what everyone expected. He just continues to make plays every week. So, you know, there's not a lot of 
questions about this cornerback group right now. Obviously, they're without Marvell Tell, so they're going to get him back probably next year if he decides to play. And, you know, there's really not a lot of questions to how productive this group is. But, I mean, Cody said it before we went into the episode that really, besides, you know, Kenny Moore and Rocky Sin, outside of this year, nobody else is under contract. So, you know, it's kind of the question of, do you let some of these guys go? Do you keep them on the team? And what do you do with the future? Because obviously we know Rocky Sin's going to be around for a little bit longer, and Kenny Moore obviously will be. But Xavier Rhodes will still most likely be a short-term thing. So what do you do here, Cody? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that is the biggest question mark. Like, What is your future at corner? You have probably two of your top three corners locked down for the next couple of years, Rocky Sin and Kenny Moore. So that's good news. But yeah, Xavier Rhodes, you know, do you resign him to a one-year, two-year deal? You do kind of what you do with Pierre Desir, sign him to a couple-year deal. So, you know, if he does start to decline, and we've seen it with corner play, um, whenever you're, you know, 30, the corner play can really decline quickly. So do you, do you have that kind of contract where if he's playing poorly, you can just let him walk, let him go, and you're not really strapped to him long-term and committed to him long-term? Um, and then, yeah, yeah, TJ Carey, I mean, credit him. He stepped in when Kenny Moore went out with that rib injury, and he played really well. He's, when we talked about this all offseason. He's been Kenny Moore insurance. That's the big reason why he was signed. Um, and he showed, you know, it was very seamless, it seemed like, when he stepped in there at that uh, third cornerback position, slot corner, he played really well. Um, so, you know, the question mark with those two guys, I think, will really change how we kind of look at this corner position. I think you do probably re-sign both of these guys because they're both playing out of their minds above what we even thought they could play. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I think the question mark just is that other corner position. How long is Xavier Rhodes going to continue this high play? Do you potentially look to the future this offseason? Maybe there's a corner in free agency you like you bring in, or you draft a guy kind of early at the cornerback position. But not a ton of question marks here beyond those things. Yeah, and, you know, that's that's a great thing to have because, you know, that was the biggest question mark, I think, for you and I defensively going into this season, you know, is the cornerback group is either going to be the bread and butter of this defense or they're going to be the demise of how this defense plays. And they've certainly not been a demise this year, so that's great to see. And then the really the only question we can really think of amongst this safety group right now And it's probably a question that I know most Colts fans would agree with here on the collective answer for this. I want to know what Cody thinks, but do you re-sign Malik Hooker? Because obviously Malik Hooker went down early in this year and week two against the Vikings, torn ACL for the second time now. So, you know, it's kind of an issue with health. He has never really stayed on the field for very long in a Colts uniform. And obviously, Julian Blackman has come in and lit the deep, lit the NFL on, on fire right now. I mean, he's second right now in Defensive Rookie of the Year standings, only behind Chase Young. Uh, Julian Blackman could potentially win that role. But right now, Blackman and Kari Willis are the starting safeties. There's no question about it. These two deserve to be in that spot. And then, you know, there's pretty solid depth behind – you know, Julian Blackman at that free safety spot, you know, Tavon Wilson can play some strong safety at times as well. But, you know, the ultimate question, do you bring Hooker back for depth purposes? Obviously, Hooker would not, you know, be the starter because Julian Blackman has outperformed him already in that. But do you even bring him back or is he even wanting to come back? I mean, he still sounds like he's committed to the Colts, but I don't know, especially since, you know, there's there's going to be some cap issues after this year. you got to think of guys to get rid of. Is Hooker going to demand that money? Because that money's probably going to go somewhere else, right, Cody? Yeah, I'm not re-signing him. I'm not touching him um, at this point. Yeah, he's been a big disappointment. Um, first Chris Ballard pick ever. Um, and unfortunately, one of your boys at Ohio State, he just has not worked out. Um, and that's unfortunate because he had a lot of talent. Um, he, he is, a, you know, a very athletic guy. I just think right now, no, you know, especially with the emergence of Julian Blackman, that really cements it for me. There's no need to go back to that. I mean, when this defense, when Malik Cooker was on the field with this defense, it seems like they were, they were always struggling, it seems like. to You know, there's always miscommunication. 
There were some stupid things that happened. Hooker had moments, but when Julian Blackman came on, this defense has just been lights, night and day different. Uh, it's just crazy how much better this defense has been with Julian Blackman. Um, you know, Blackman, unlike Hooker, is not afraid to go and come up and make a tackle. Although we'll, I'll say this, Willie Hooker did get a little bit better at tackling. But, you know, just from a consistency standpoint, Julian Blackman is, is heads and tails uh, so much better than, than uh, Malik Hooker right now. And, you know, maybe that's something to do with the scheme, maybe not. But uh, right now, no, I, I am not pre-signing Malik Hooker unless he, for some reason, becomes this big, big team guy where he's like, I'm willing to take this pay cut, essentially. Uh, to be a role player on this defense, I can't imagine him doing that. I, I imagine he wants to go out somewhere. He wants to go get paid somewhere um, and wants a chance to, to prove himself, maybe in a different defensive scheme. So probably not right now. That is a question mark, uh, but I think that's the greatest question mark right now. We have a pretty clear answer, and that just tells you how good the safety position is right now. Yeah, I mean, it is unfortunate that, you know, what's happened with Malik Hooker over this first four years – you know, he's just not had any luck on his side. I mean, the biggest thing about uh, about Malik Hooker, in order for him to be successful in this league, is the health. And that has to come first because right now, like I said before, he's barely been able to stay on the field long enough to produce numbers because, you know, he's just not, just not been healthy. Second part is, is I do believe the scheme has been what has hurt him a lot in this defense. Obviously, he is a ball hawking safety he's a guy that likes to hang back and you know track the quarterback's eyes and go up and get the football I think he's still better at doing that than Julian Blackman in a little bit of ways you know Blackman certainly is still good at uh, coverage and can make plays we saw that in against Minnesota and obviously he has had a couple interceptions on the year so I get that but I think Malik Hooker still is a better ball hawking safety but ultimately, this, that's just not what this system does. And like you said, the only way I can really anticipate him staying on this roster, if, he's, if he takes a team-friendly deal and be, becomes that role player you're talking about and will just play like certain, certain types of situations. You know, obvious passing down defense, I definitely could see. That would be pretty fun to see him and Julian Blackman on the field together. Uh, playing obvious uh, passing down situations because I think both of those guys uh, are better on uh, pass coverage than Kari Willis. But yeah, it, it, it's it's going to be rough, you know, seeing Malik Hooker go. Like you said, the first Chris Ballard pick ever. And, you know, a lot of people were stoked when Malik Hooker came because like, wow, you know, he was the best safety in college football that one year that he played at Ohio State. He was lighting the world on fire. And we're like, how in the hell did he go to number 15? And just, you know, we kind of understand now why, you know, and it's weird too, because never had injury problems really that much at Ohio State, but obviously it followed him into the NFL. And, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't anticipate much from Malik going forward, but I think that's going to do it for this one, guys, for the defensive side. Let us know what you think. Is there any other questions that you thought we could have answered? Do you agree with our answers or do you think there's something else we missed? Thank you guys again so much for tuning in. And as always, go Colts.